it. Just see, see how it goes. And yeah. what do you say for me? Because I've asked everybody to do this so far. Who you are, <laughs> what time of the century we're in, <laughs> and what you do. Oh, well, hi, I'm Sean Cubis. I'm director of the Programme of Media and Communications at the University of Melbourne. Um, and it's now September 2009. We're in, in Terry's studio in Somerset. <laughs> and what do you... OK, so... Uh, what do you think the general man and woman in the street imagine high definition is? Uh, I think basically it's a, the impression most of us have is that it's the plasma screens we can see on sale in the high street stores. So I think the, the connection is entirely um, to um, domestic broadcast and playback technology. So it, it is actually stitched to a brand in the same way that DVD is stitched to a kind of, uh, uh, like a trademark almost. So something that's going to pleasure them? Yeah, it's, there's a, one of our PhD students at Melbourne, Jeff Bird, who's also a high def cameraman um, and teaches video at uh, Swinburne, is, um, has done some really interesting research on uh, early adopters of HD in, uh, uh, in domestic formats. Um, although his research isn't completed yet, it's very nearly complete. And he's got some really interesting findings about why people want HD in that early adopter phase, because it's still very much early adopter. We don't yet have digital TV in Australia. There's a number of reasons for that. Uh, but you can get some HD, especially if you've got a satellite link. Um, and there are some terrestrial channels that are beginning to put some programs into HD. And um, plus, of course, people have got Blu-ray and other sorts of um, high definition playback. Um, the general tendency is that it's a male purchase rather than a female one. Um, the craze for building home cinemas seems to be less significant than having a domestic living room um, plasma or LCD high def screen. There's a very strong set of evidence that people actually redesign their interiors in order to house this. So they'll change the sight lines from uh, a typical Australian open plan um, ground floor where you, you would see straight through from the kitchen into the living room. They'll move a curtain wall in order that <clears throat> the kitchen will get the best sight line onto the, um, onto the screen. There's frequently, um, a, I think a really interesting thing about it is a lot of people see it as a family technology. There's, for the last 30 years or so, the proliferation of, of cheap TVs has meant that people, children in particular, would go off to their bedrooms to watch TV and there'd be a separate TV for each family member. Now there's a single um, prestige outfit in the living room. There's a much higher tendency for people to go in for family viewing, which I think in itself is a really interesting idea. And there's also, I suppose this is something I can remember from the early days of colour TV, that um, you would go around to the neighbours to see colour. And there's a little bit of that still goes on with HD, certainly in Oz and perhaps here as well, that it's, um, it's still sufficient novelty for people to come round to watch, especially special events and sporting events, things like that, or to see a, a particular movie and, and do it as a social event. So there are a whole lot of things about prestige, about family, about um, a luxury purchase, which um, in some instances is, is kind of a, a, a sense that you've made it. Um, so it has all sorts of functions. Almost none of them are really strongly technically based, although there are all the consumer magazines to help people decide which high def to, to, to go for. Um, a lot of the evidence tends to point towards people really appreciating the sound as much as they do the increased vision. Um, do, you think, do you think that basically it's a very successful market strategy or market design. I mean, the later question mm. follows about, hey, what do you, what do you think it is, apart from mm. what they think mm. it is, mm. and what, what's the relationship between what the corporations have designed as a commodity? Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's, there's a famous um, graph that 
um, demonstrates how uh, the uptake of new technologies works. So things like, say, the CD player, you get the early adopter phase, you get the very rapid growth, and then you get a plateau when you've more or less saturated the market. And with certain technologies, that's about as far as you can go. You really can't do much with a CD player after a certain point, and they become so cheap, you proliferate them, you put them into everything. You know, it's got a CD player in your computer, a CD player in the car, a CD player in the fridge. I mean, you know, it's good. Um, <laughs> and I think with um, the sort of 1080 type standard um, plasma screen, that's the sort of thing that, or even 1920, that there's the kind of a plateau that you, if you get the highest high def and you get the um, the better manufacturers, then you've really got to the top of it. And there's, there isn't a, another thing to add to it beyond the, what people usually put in their first install, which is a, a kind of sound system and um, a, a PVR and those sorts of peripherals. So um, in Oz, that's still at the very beginning because, as I say, they, they haven't really gone for digital TV yet. Um, but I so think given it, all of that, what do you think it is, really? If what, it, there is oh, really? what I think it is, really? Yeah. Um, well, I think on the one hand, yes, it is absolutely um, what do we do next in order to nurture the, the total market in consumer electronics. So we've got a DVD market saturated, so we need to up the ante on that. Um, we've got a saturated market in television sets, especially as they proliferated through the house with you know, the, the sort of multi-TV household. Um, Radios are saturated, mobile phones are saturated, computers are pretty much saturated now. So the moving into the next technology is a really important way of making sure that the, the large corporations in the technology industry, consumer technology industry, keep themselves in a, on a, their regular growth pattern. And this is a pretty good way to do it. Uh, as prices fall, um, I think they're, and also the lifetime of some of the technologies in improves so projectors and uh, and screens have now got much better lifetimes than they had a few years back and they're far more affordable so they'll head towards market saturation and you typically I would expect you know within about five or six years so there's that whole side of it on the other hand there's there's also the question of um, production towards high resolution um, and that I think is probably more interesting in one sense which we already saw in the 1980s when um, the first inklings at high def would, would be coming in. Um, you know, it, was in. It was a lab technology at the time, but there was some inkling that this would happen. And some of the, um, like the, the old BSB satellite system, which used um, it was a DMAC, the, um, the um, transmission standard, very high quality transmission standard. And it was kitted up and future-proofed. Um, of course, when it was taken over by Sky and became Big Sky B, they, they dropped that part of it. But future proofing meant, for example, that sh prestige shows like Inspector Morse were being shot on Super 16 to future proof them for high definition. So they, um, they had a, a bigger picture area, they had separate sound, um, stereo sound, they, um, and they had really high quality image so that they knew that those library things would then have a life on high def, which they expected low definition. Um, 65 line type stuff would, would not have. I think at the moment what's happening in production sectors is that a lot of people are using high def as future proofing. So, uh, sorry, they're using high resolution recording technologies and various kinds of production technologies because they want to future proof against the next set of uh, beyond 1920 resolution. And also uh, I think particularly in the film industry where, for example, 6K psychs are really you know, standard now, um, it means that you've got a library of things like, say, the, the mountain landscapes for Lord of the Rings are all 6K. Um, uh, I'm not quite sure. I think they gathered them on still and then um, built them in um, 3D. Um, and then they, so they've recorded these things in, 6K, so that when they do re-releases, they've got a, a sort of near enough IMAX quality, let's say, um, just in case the big display technology is moving in that direction. So for a lot of purposes, I think they, that sort of technology, or using various kind of like 60 mil film, for example, is another one of those ways of future-proofing. So that 
as standards rise, certain kinds of prestige product, um, especially some of those really expensive movies or expensive TV series, are going to be ready to be libraried and go into heavy rotation on you know, future cable and satellite channels. So they want, in many respects, production wants to be ahead of the, the consumer end or even the, um, uh, the sort of cinema type industry end because they expect those to go up in quality. Um, so that I think there's a kind of separate set of interests there. Um, so there's a move towards higher resolutions mm -hmm. anywhere outside of high definition. Yeah, but yeah. Um, I suppose um, that 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 comes to the idea of what do you, what do you think the relationship is between um, high definition and higher resolutions and where um, high definition fits and high resolution fits with the rest of uh, digital technologies and where we yeah can't help but go there can we really yeah yeah when well, this. Uh... And the resolution issue seems to me to have to do, like, obviously it's to do with the, um, the number of pixels you get on a screen. Um, it's also, I think, to do with a number of other things. So one of those would be the kind of codecs that are being used. So once you've got um, a captured image and then you're pushing it down a cable or through um, a, a terrestrial transmission or satellite transmission um, basically you're uh, you're going to have to squeeze it down a thin pipe so no matter how good your gathering is and how good your display is somewhere along the track it's being it's being compressed and it's got to be decompressed and almost all the available codecs seem to be uh, I think sort of um, 264 um, MPEG-3 MPEG-4 um, and various other ones are almost invariably using tools like vector prediction um, and when they're doing that they're destroying a lot of the information so once it's compressed there's there's very very little way you can actually decompress without really significant loss of information so that I think is one of the the, the core problems um, so we're used now to seeing for example DVD playback um, with say in, in, in any kind of field of, of you know, if you've got a large field of, of roughly similar colour, see those great big blocky chunks as the, um, the, the image is sliced into, um, into blocks, groups of blocks, um, and then it's a, predictions are, are set in by the codec so that it will fill it with you know, this kind of black, you know, black sort of um, F, 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 nine you know and you'll <laughs> you'll just get this kind of you know a huge zone of that and then another zone of um F -f 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 10 or, or eight or something and you'll uh, so you get these artifacts which lose all that kind of detail that you spend so much time gathering in the first instance uh, so the i think the codec is one of these things the refresh rate always seems to me a really interesting one as well that the um that certain kinds of movements that um, and some artists have actually really used this from way back when Dave Critchley did his um, oh, what's the name of the piece he did in the late seventies, which is the head shaking. It's a British video artist, Dave Critchley, um, and he um, he deliberately sh shot himself shaking his head from side to side. His hair was quite long, so it's kind of just going like this as fast as he possibly could, which is faster than the camera could actually gather. Um, and then he slowed the playback down uh, so that the, there's a kind of an artifact of you know, sort of two or three layers of face in pointing in different directions, which he'd actually deliberately set out to make himself look like a Francis Bacon portrait. It's actually <laughs> kind of amazing. Um, there are similar kind of artifacts that occur nowadays. So um, the art British artist Tim Head, for example, is doing work where he programs, um, programs screens directly um, and says, you know, display this color, now display this color, now display this color. And the computer processor operates far faster than the refresh rate of the screen. So you begin to get these artifacts where you get a, you know, a chunk of color A, but it's only covering a quarter of the screen before it's, it's pushed down and then you know, the next color comes in, but it never actually gets a complete screen. So you get these extraordinary textured artifacts of 
um, which are about the refresh rate. And I think that to me is also part of the resolution issue is, is about the speed of perception as well as um, the, the um, acuteness of individual points. Um, third one that really concerns me a lot is color. Um, so the, um, there's the issue first of a color space that's available and um, pretty much to the best of my knowledge, and I'm, I'm uh, probably a little behind the ball here, but we've got a series of problems with color management. One is that um, CCD and CMOS chips respond to color in very particular ways, but they also have, let's just follow the color spaces issue first. They, they have, um, if say the, you know, the, the human eye can see in a, a color space yay big from um, to the edges of ultraviolet to the edges of infrared um, and with a, uh, luminance factors of a certain amount you know, up from the very bright to the very, very dim. Um, by and large, digital devices will occupy a much smaller area. Typical computer display has less than 40% of the, uh, the human capacity for, for vision. Printers are the same, screens, etc. So, um, and I th believe this is the case with many of our gathering devices that they can, they have to s squeeze in, to use algorithms to squeeze in the, uh, the outlying colors so that they will fit inside the available color space. Maximizing the difference between the colors. So if they're bringing in two colors from out here, they don't simply bring them both inside, but they, they will move them in relation to each other to maximize difference so that we're getting apparent color resolution. And very cleverly done. I mean, it's fantastic work. Um, as we try and move from one device to another, almost every device has a separate and distinct color space. So a camera will have one, a piece of software will have another, a server will have a third, um, a TV or um, a PVR or whatever will have another one, a screen will have a fifth one. So getting the man management of color on that stream is a really big issue. It's, it's even bigger for printing, but it's, it's a huge issue for, um, for the workflow management of um, getting signals from uh, you know, the sharp end of the lens through to wherever it's being displayed. And the, the migration of colors from one to another, like the, the Macintosh color gamut is totally different to the IBM color gamut, it's totally different to the Dell color gamut, the Linux color gamut's different, blah, blah, blah. Um, People like um, or, or Adobe have developed uh, a system which they claim gives about 80% of uh, a color space of, of, of relative to the human um, capacity for vision. Um, but it's a proprietary one. Not everybody wants to use it. It's not necessarily going to be supported by available codecs. Um, and it's, it's actually one of the issues that appears to be being debated in um, the amongst uh, the motion picture expert groups at the moment is with what kind of color management to support inside MPEG. So that's that's an issue. The other one that is a little bit more arcane, I suppose, but it's it's one that I find kind of interesting. Is if you, it's easier to think of with a still camera. Um, if you're taking in uh, light from a still camera, um, it's reaching. Um, Cutting a long story short, it's, it, it's reaching a square zone um, somewhere now for the modern CCD, about seven microns. Um, so little seven micron square unit, which is exposed for the duration of the, um, the exposure. Uh, and it collects the light and then converts it into an ele electrical charge. And that's then drained off in, in kind of lockstep down the, the chip um, for storage as voltage and converted into a, a digital signal, let's just say, into a, a numerical representation. And what's really intriguing for me is that, that the color that's being recorded is, number one, it's averaged over the period of exposure. So if something moves during, and you were talking about a very small area, but in a, a blade of grass moving will change its tone, you get an average and that average is recorded by the time it comes out as a digital signal as a whole number. And there are no fractions. You know, there are no halves or quarters or thirds. Or, um, so you've got an averaged whole number unit 
for the color. Um, and that will then have to be recorded inside one of the several systems for um, recording color. And those, I think, are... There's a, an absolute limit to the to this the range of distinctions that you can get if well, you're going to use that. I mean, if you took um, what you've described about color and applied that to resolution, you mm. could say similar similar things about the way we mm. represent what's out there to the way that we display it. But my mm. my next question is uh, related to all of this because do you think there is such a thing as a high definition aesthetic? And is it a production mm. of the limitations of the system, or is there something other than the limitations of the system that artists exploit to produce uh. art? Well, just, I think there is in a certain sense, but it's very difficult to point out. I think the one of the things that's really distinctive about this period in the first decade of the twentieth century, the twenty-first century, is the divergence between high definition and handheld low resolution screens. And the handheld screen typically is using things like flash video uh, on LCD, um, and they're really, really poor quality. Um, I think the great test to do is to, I did inadvertently, was um, I downloaded a, just as an experiment really, I downloaded a movie from iTunes and they're designed obviously to play on the iPods. And I tried watching it on the uh, on the computer screen and it looks awful, absolutely dreadful. On the iPod, it looks pretty cute, cute and it's nice to have it in your hand and you know, for certain kinds of things like you know, catching up with the sport or the news or something, it's, it's uh, uh, or probably a lot of soap. I take, and I take great pleasure, and I do this presentation where I take great pleasure in t shooting something on a, on a phone and putting out of a 2K projector. Oh, wow. Oh, yes. Just to see what's happening. And it's that kind of thing. Yes, yeah. And they're hugely artifactual, but they can't, they're good enough. And I think that's one of the characteristics, curiously, of, of uh, contemporary media is that they're good enough. Mm. Um, the colour response is good enough. The resolutions are good enough. The refresh rates are good enough. Yeah. Um, and a lot of them, a lot of the techniques and technologies are designed um, to fool the eye, so that uh, or the, the optic apparatus, um, to not necessarily the eye, but often the um, not just the retina, but the, the the brain, because the brain will interpolate missing bits. Um, and the most famous one probably is the the um, sliding doors in Star Trek, which um, Star Wars, which were shot open and then shut with a slight of swooshing noise. And everybody imagines they see them yeah. slide too. But of course they don't, you know, there's, there's no inter but so we're interpolating. And it happens a lot with sport where um, very frequently with vector prediction, things like say uh, uh, big field games like cricket with a small ball, the ball will simply disappear because it, um, the, the vector prediction says it's just going to be green here. It's not going to have a little red ball rolling through it. Uh, so the ball will appear at different spots. Uh, and by and large, especially on small screens, people will actually interpolate the missing parts because they can, they can see the trajectory in, from a very small cue and they can work it out and the, you know, the brain sort of does it on its own. But that kind of good enough is, I think it's very, um, I mean, that is a tool for artists as well. Um, so one of the, the um, things there, for example, is, is we know that it, in both screen and, you know, that's to say, light source technologies and reflected light technologies like projection, it's really, really hard to reach black. Um, the neighboring pixels plus ambient light and um, the use of, of saying LCDs and backlights means it, it's very, very hard to get a, a, a black. You can't just not show light well, in an okay, area. Okay, I want to press you a bit here because yeah. I think we're, this is a very important place we're at here. That uh, the thing about high definition and its manufacture in a sense is high mm. and it's defined. Mm. So there's a proposition that it's more than good enough. Mm. Now whether mm. it is or not is an argu mm. arguable point, but the resolutions that we're possible capable of going to are beyond, or at least equal more. Yeah, are good are good more mm. than good enough. Mm. So I'm kind of interested in what the aesthetic might be, not where the artist might explore or exploit the problems mm. of something to make something interesting, but actually where actually it's, it surpasses 
mm. good enough. What do, you, what do you think around that area? Well, I think there's a really interesting little anecdote Jeff Bird, the PhD student I was mentioning before, came up with, um, which is that when they're displaying plasmas and other high-def kit in consumer stores, they almost invariably show animations because um, consumers are often put off by the fact that you can see um, you know, skin tone and blemishes and you know, sort of shaving stubble and so forth. And these lovely kind of Pixar surfaces render far more attractively than, than your typical piece of, of, of realism. So one of the things that's really intriguing about this on the one hand is realism is intrinsic, I think, to digital media. I think it, it's one of the fascinating things about it um, because what effectively a camera is, is, is a photon counter. Um, it's, it's a very, very accurate device for, for the numerical recording of data coming in through a lens namely sort of photons. So in that sense, it's a scientific instrument and it, it's highly realistic. But it's not realistic necessarily in the illusionist sense of a kind of um, 19th century um, Beaux-Arts painting tradition uh, or even a photographic realism. So it's not necessarily looking at the same thing. Um, but one of the things that's, I think is, is really in, intriguing about digital also is that, of course, you don't need a camera to generate visual imagery. So you can generate uh, from any kind of signal at all, really. Um, and that means effectively resolution is infinite. And you're not, um, so if you build something in, um, in 3D or in a, uh, especially in vector-based programs, you can magnify it endlessly and they'll still hold their, uh, their the cloud sheet. Could you say what vector? Vector bases as well as oh. the raster scan. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sure. And, uh, so, programs like Illustrator, uh, the Adobe um, 2D drafting program, um, instead of. Um, sorry, let's start the other way around. A bitmap program like Photoshop um, gives an address for each pixel. So, it says, you know, take counting from the. Um, sorry, I'm talking on the wrong side here. From top left to bottom right. Um, so there's zero zero up here, and there's kind of uh, was it 1080, 1920 down at the bottom, um, and every pixel has an address, and then you assign to each address um, a hexadecimal color value or a, uh, you know, some kind of color value, uh, and then um, you've got your you know, you've got a numerical um, spot on a grid with an the instruction map, of what right? to put it. Yeah. yeah, so you have the map. With a vector, what you do is, uh, so you would, in bitmap, you're drawing a line by putting a, a, a series of addresses and say, put a spot of black here, there, 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 there. With a vector, what you do is you put a point of origin, point of, um, uh, and a point of destination, and then you apply an algorithm, so you can make it go like that. Yeah. Make it a sign or uh, any complex kind of curve. Uh, the result of that is that because you've got a, a, an algorithm Ex being expressed in a uh, in a, a line, um, no matter how much you magnify it, it will actually keep following the algorithm that's that underlies it. So you don't get those kind of raster jaggies, the little square steps along the edge. Um, and most three D programs operate as uh, vector. Um, I think there are one or two that don't, but almost everything uses uses vector. That means if you build um, a, a kind of Pixar type of character. Um, you can zoom right in on this character, you know, zoom into an eyeball or something, um, and you will still get very high resolution. You zoom back out and see them in the landscape, and they're still at the same kind of resolution. You don't get at the artifacts of um, of jaggies that you would get had you animated in a in a bitmap. Um, I can't remember why I'm talking about this. No, now. that's good. Now you <laughs> just told us what how vector vector mm. scan works, and mm. um, it's interesting to me that one of the earliest uh, color synthesizer uh, inventors that I came across mm. had a vector a vector scan instrument. No. Um, but okay. back to the back to thing. So we were talking about um, uh, that was my fault for sending you off there. Basically, <laughs> um, we were talking about um, potential aesthetics mm. of something that is beyond good enough, and uh, and mm. the relationship possibly. Let me just introduce an idea: relationship uh, to film, for instance, mm. of high definition, um, where, for instance, a, di a director of photography's job on a feature film was to say something about the narrative by. Uh, changing the colour base or the resolution base or doing something to mm. the film which often meant a material manipulation um, 
in uh, a lot of post-production in uh, high definition we have to put a look on afterwards and um, so the production of atmosphere is an mm, issue mm, so there's the mm. artist at one end who's messing around with the problems of a medium to mm, get something mm. there are the directors of photography at the other end of a medium with a, a little bit of a problem because they can gloss a look onto something but I'm just wondering mm. if there is anything in the in the uh, aesthetics of the medium that might be, or if there is an aesthetic, is yeah, there an aesthetic yeah. of, of the realistic practice of... Yeah, well, I think I'd just add one more person to that chain because I yeah. think it's um, a, a poorly calibrated screen um, when you're a consumer, if, um, you know, if you have a default setting on and you see, uh, it will automatically um, uh, gain, for example, if, if, if the um, default setting says, you know, Put more gain in here and put more luminance into an image because it, you know, my God, I've paid three thousand quid for this screen. I don't want to see a load of mud. I want to see nice, sharp, clear colours. And, <laughs> um, uh, and screens often add resolution um, because the the apparent resolution of, of the the, um, the black line grid. As it were, sort of going back to the Trini, Sony Trinitron cathode ray tube, and they're now installed in. Uh, uh, really noticeable in DLP projectors, for example, that, that you've got this, these very fine grid lines. Um, but they actually not only are there as an artifact of the little separate mirrors in DLP, but um, because they add apparent resolution. Um, but that often means, and a, a lot of tools, um, domestic consumer tools, um, also add um, edge finding algorithms so that there's um, things to, to um, help either they put a, a very fine black or white line around outlines in order to separate out the, the um, clearly demarked objects to add more apparent resolution. Um, 